uh, Dr. Vick. Welcome on behalf of IUSSTF and uh, Itihasa. Uh, thank you for speaking to us today. Um, I will uh, uh, request you to kindly just briefly introduce yourself and then we'll move into the questions. The floor is yours. Sure, sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I am currently the uh, Head of the of the deep learning and AI research area at TCS. TCS, as you know, has a very extensive corporate research program where we have multiple disciplines, uh, multiple research areas, specializing in different uh, domains that we feel are uh, valuable to our business. Uh, deep learning and AI is one of them, and now uh, this this area is re is the newest. It's been established only uh, in 2016 or so and has now grown to uh, you know about 100 people or so um, so yeah that's the that's the very kind of brief gist of uh, what i'm doing right yeah uh, thank you thank you for that introduction dr vig and i would request my colleague dr bhattacharya to 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 start with the interview chaitali thank you thank you Vishuta. uh well uh, as you rightly said the word valuable to the business and you being into that corporate research program Perhaps my first question would automatically be as to uh, what is the current and the future demand for the AI or the AI related masters and the PhD graduates in your industry? So the, the demand continues to be strong. It, it, uh, so you know, when we first started out recruiting for AI and uh, particularly for deep learning uh, trained people, uh, from the IITs the, uh, and the IISCs and premier institutes within India. Uh, uh, up till about 2016 or 17, it was hugely problematic uh, because, uh, to be honest, I, I felt that Indian academia woke up to deep learning a little late. Um, I think the world had already uh, moved on to deep learning, uh, you know, as an established technique for doing AI oriented projects by the by 2016 and uh, and, and we were uh, we had very few researchers very few faculty actually working in this area um, and uh, this was a big problem for us when we went for recruitment in 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 that time things have happily changed since then and now there is a wide uh, you know sort of net of a wide pool of people to to uh, who are familiar with at least what what these latest technologies, uh, the latest uh, you know um, advancements in AI, um, and uh, and and things are improving. But I still feel that we are underperforming uh, given our stature as a software nation. Uh, I feel we are underperforming in this, uh, in in terms of innovation, in term, in, in what we could possibly do uh, with with the technology that is now uh, being rapidly advancing and is being uh, and the capabilities that uh, that that it's showing. Uh, I think that this is under leveraged within India and underutilized and can. Um, and that we we need to expand the pool of people that are trained in in these technologies if we are going to fully utilize this as a nation as uh, and and for improving the lives of uh, a large number of people so uh, demand demand is still very very strong uh, especially for uh, people uh, who are phds in in ai and who have a solid understanding of these techniques. And we expect that the demand will continue to be strong at least for the foreseeable future for the next uh, five or 10 years at least. Um, in fact, there's likely to be uh, a serious shortage of people uh, moving forward in the industry. Yeah. Thank you, that, that, that's really true. I mean, that's exactly the reason why this entire UISS, this UI, uh, USI AI initiative has been to kind of find out and do the landscaping. So uh, what would be the next uh, follow-up question from my end would be, uh, what are the hot skills in the AI and ML in your industry? And what do you see as these, uh, you know, hot skills in the coming year, maybe in over 10 years? Right, so, I mean, of course, uh, when we started recruiting, 
we would honestly uh, be looking for anyone who's had any sort of exposure to AI and uh, in particular deep learning. Uh, three years ago, if you had, if, if a student had even, you know, run a deep learning model in some project in college, uh, we would we would kind of look favorably upon such candidates, right? But uh, times have now changed, and the uh, the pool, as I said, has grown. The pool of people who are now exposed to these technologies has grown, and uh, increasingly we're we're looking at more specialized roles. So we're looking at people who are who have exposure to, let's say, NLP or who have exposure to IoT applications or, or have done projects in robotics applications. Uh, so these are all, you know, maybe, maybe exposure, exposure to medical imaging, to healthcare. Uh, and increasingly we're finding that we are able to, to find candidates who have worked on projects in these sorts of areas on most, on deeper projects on these areas, as opposed to let's say three or four years ago where we, struggle to really find anyone who's done anything in deep learning at all right so uh, so, so in, these are so these are some of the uh, you know hot skills being able to uh, you know not just run a deep model but being able to uh, design an architecture read a paper understand what that what, what the architecture is saying being able to develop that uh, understand uh, a particular domain let's say in, whether it's medical imaging whether it's uh, natural language processing understand uh, not just you know the the architecture and the nuts and bolts of how to build something but actually understand the underlying concepts and why certain architectures are more appropriate or certain ap for certain applications when um, you know when uh, symbolic techniques are needed when uh, you know, all, all of all of these are very, very valuable skills. So what, what we're going to see going forward, I think, is that we're going to see more and more specialized roles for, uh, for people in AI. So the, 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 while the previous five years or, or 10 years has been a lot about democratization of AI so that everybody is able to use and apply AI for their applications. Increasingly, I, find, I feel that going forward, emphasis will be on domain experts, people who are very familiar with techniques uh, for uh, you know, either, let's say, a FinTech or applying them to FinTech and combining those AI techniques with uh, other techniques like blockchain and uh, in healthcare, you know, combining uh, your knowledge of genetics with uh, with AI and in in in, in IoT, for example, and combining your knowledge of uh, you know edge computing with AI and cloud computing with AI. Uh, so these these are uh, the, the, these are sort of going to be uh, the more hybrid sort of skill sets that are going to dominate going forward. We expect. I mean, the anticipation is that you know robotics is going to be extremely. Uh, uh, sort of in demand and going forward as control systems are getting better, perception systems are getting better. Um, uh, we have IoT systems that uh, with 5G coming on are going to be omnipresent so that there's going to be a lot of demand for AI applications around, uh, around 5G going forward. Healthcare is going to be the revolution, uh, revolutionized, especially personalized medicine. As sequencing becomes cheaper and cheaper, it's going to, sequencing data is going to become widespread and available. Everybody is going to get sequenced. And uh, that what that means is that these data-driven techniques can then be applied to these uh, the healthcare applications to give you more personalized, precise uh, kind of diagnoses, right? This is, these are some of the, uh, uh, these are just some of the areas, the other areas, of course, uh, deploying and making AI real is still a very, very uh, valued skill. So being able to, uh, there's a lot of gap between publishing a paper in AI and actually making something live, deployable, secure, privacy preserving, uh, um, and, and being able to learn, adapt on the fly in a deployment setting. There's a huge gap between what the papers are reporting and what the industry is actually being able to consume. So that gap has to be bridged and people who are very good at ML ops or 
uh, what we call ML ops or AI ops is uh, are going to be very valued. People who understand when to use which techniques, whether deep learning, there's there's a rush towards deep learning at the moment, but there's still a place for symbolic techniques and rule-based systems, and uh, and so uh, you know people who understand how to combine these different facets of AI, these different techniques in AI appropriately for a large complex use case are going to be hugely in demand, right? Um, so the, this, is, this is just some of the uh, sort of some of the ideas. And, and the other aspect is to make AI more efficient. You know, there's a lot of work happening around edge computing and, and, uh, and what, what's needed is AI models that are not that data hungry, that can learn from experience, very little uh, data. And so meta learning techniques and you know, transfer learning techniques and all these tech people who are very familiar with all of this uh, are going to be in, in very high demand in is, is, our, is our take, right? Uh, thanks, that, that really made again a lot of sense. Uh, again, just a curiosity. I mean, whatever what skills that you're talking about or the domain knowledges that you are, the company actually search for are uh, something that I presume mostly you can get from a PhD students, right? I mean, they are they know how to kind of connect and that kind of uh, transition knowledge and all. You can actually find it from them. Uh, if I am, uh, do you actually recruit uh, graduate levels also? And in yes, case absolutely. you do, in case do you actually uh, can you see these kind of qualities or these kind of knowledge in them? If not, what is the soft skill that you search in those kind of students? Right. So to some extent, yes, especially uh, in these very premier institutes that TCS often visits, the IITs, the uh, we do get some exceptional students who are uh, actually extremely uh, competent. Uh, at some of these skills, uh, of course, the depth uh, is 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 not as much as you would expect from a PhD. They just haven't had the time to work on a particular area for that long, so it's understandable. But uh, but they do exhibit a lot of soft skills, like you mentioned, that that are very important. Uh, one of the one of the things we insist on in TCS is that uh, students be able to produce. Uh, regular lab notes when they work with us, so when we take them on for internships, etc. So this builds the uh, this builds kind of a systematic uh, sort of up, uh, update updation of uh, experimental results, being able to report properly, being able to write uh, what the experiments that they're performing properly, the uh, the project, uh, how close they are to the project goals. Um, being able to uh, be kind of invested in the outcome of the project, so you that that is really what what I feel differentiates a great hire from a uh, not so great hire is that uh, a great hire, I mean, they really really care that the project is at the end of the day works, and and they are invested themselves in in ensuring that it does. Um, and uh, they they have the ability to kind of uh, you know pull information, read the appropriate papers, uh, you know, get the appropriate code from GitHub, experiment with it, play with it, and figure out uh, how to solve a particular problem. Right. So these are some of the soft skills that we look for people who really try, even if they fail. But but you can see from their lab notes that you know they've done so many experiments, they've tried all of this. Sometimes things fail, and that's okay. At least, at least in our world uh, of research, that's okay. But, uh, but at least uh, you know the, the 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 line of thinking is very clear, and they know what they're doing. So these are some, these are some of the soft skills. Of course, background knowledge uh, of, and the basic uh, sort of education and you know the, the concepts that they have are extremely important as well. So to ensure that they. Uh, you know, they're not doing something like you no know, overfitting their models or, uh, you know, or overfitting or underfitting their models or, or leaking uh, or suffering from data leakage or anything like that, right? So uh, those, those basic things uh, uh, we expect that the student knows already. Um, and uh, on top of that, if the student is able to competently execute uh, and perform, uh, we generally rate such students quite, quite highly, right? 
uh, if they're regular, they update their notes they, and they keep asking questions and, you know, you can see them looking uh, at, at the web. They're, they're well read. They know, they know what um, everything about their project uh, already and they know the relevant literature. Um, th these are some of the qualities that we're, that we're looking at. Right. That's that's really nice. I mean, it's very nice to hear that these are some very good hand-holding techniques, you know, I mean, to confident building and obviously a pat in the back. I'm sure this is this works good for your company. Uh, mm. The other thing that I would like to know, I'm sure you must be seeing some kind of, uh, you know, gaps in the knowledge and the skill as well uh, for these okay. current AI and these masters uh, or PhD grades in your industry. Yes, uh, so uh, yes, occasionally there are gaps. Uh, so sometimes uh, we find that, uh, you know, people are very good at, um, you know, implementing something like, um, you know, they'll, they'll be so focused on a particular problem, which is their PhD problem or their master's project or whatever, uh, that they are, uh, that they, they find it very difficult to move even slightly away from that little sort of bubble that they've uh, encapsulated themselves in. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that, you know, they, they have not been trained to go beyond uh, that problem. They've just been told, okay, this is, uh, the, this is the problem that I want you to solve. This is how to solve it. Now go ahead and implement this. And they'll do a very good job of implementing it. But, you know the real value is uh, increasingly moving in, in to future proof people's careers the increasing value is going to be in people who are able to so, uh, you know solve uh, understand new domains solve new problems move on to the next problem understand that solve the next problem and so on uh, because you know it, it's just the nature of the of the beast, unless it's a problem that is so big that is going to consume a lifetime to solve, it's unlikely that. Uh, um, so, so, so what I'm saying is that people who are, are getting extremely confident about, let's say, using deep learning, uh, and but they cannot go beyond that. They don't know what symbolic techniques are. They don't know what logic is because it's fallen out they don't they're not familiar with causal methods they're not familiar with uh, you know rule based systems and because of that because of this fad of uh, because deep learning is in demand today they will do courses in deep learning and they don't have a holistic education uh, uh, they don't have a holistic education towards uh, 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 towards AI, they have a very sort of unidimensional focus around AI. Right. So because of that, there's a bit of in, incomplete education in, in, uh, in AI, right? And somewhat narrow tunnel vision towards what they learn. So because of this, it becomes a little difficult. So again, I mean, when you talk about this incomplete education, uh... How does any of the industry help? I mean, what are the in-house trainings uh, programs that you offer to any new recruit or maybe somebody who is already existing and you want to upskill his you know, uh, knowledge? So what are the kind of in-house programs that uh, the industry runs? I don't know about the rest. I, I can tell you that TCS uh, does a lot. Uh, it has, it, it is engaged heavily with all of the IITs, all of the triple IITs, most of the top institutions in the country. We sponsor PhD programs in all of these countries where the PhD projects are actually validated by our research team. Um, that is part of, uh, part of it. Uh, then, uh, you know, the other uh, sort of way to go around this is, I think, in my suggestion is that AI needs to find its place in the school and college curriculum increasingly. Um, I think uh, that is the only way we are going to be able to build sufficient sort of uh, in-house, in-country talent, nation talent um, 
So th what that means is that, look, there's a lot about AI, like basic logic, like basic, uh, you know, deep learning that that is completely understandable by somebody even doing high school. So there's no reason not to teach them today and, in, and make sure that everybody is exposed to some level of AI, even at the school level. Uh, and then at the college level, there should be optional courses that are specifically tailored to each uh, sort of discipline. So somebody is doing an undergraduation in physics should be made to take at least one optional course for AI applications for physics. Similarly, for civil engineering, for any sort of medicine, everything, so that people, uh, you know, this becomes uh, a sort of, uh, you know, part of part and parcel of our education system, and people don't have to wait until they take specialized courses to attain this uh, this level of competency. Second thing is, of course, the online. Uh, educational programs. Uh, we we sponsor TCS sponsors, uh, you know, Coursera courses and Udacity, all these uh, online platforms uh, which offer courses. TCS has partnered with them, and all of our associates are encouraged to uh, sort of uh, take these take the relevant courses that are uh, useful for their particular uh, domain and uh, improve their skill set. And that is an ongoing process throughout their career, right? And as they acquire more and more certifications, there, uh, there, there are you know incentives and rewards and uh, career progressions that are tied to their progress uh, to their uh, through these courses, right? So that that is a, that is another way. Uh, the other thing is we have in-house training programs in which our own people undergo trainings uh, that are scheduled and organized by TCS. Uh, and uh, we, okay, we even uh, have uh, uh, people, uh, you know, we are, as I said, we have tie-ups from the IITs and the ISCs, et cetera. And we often call upon faculty and experts in these academic institutions to come and give lectures within TCS and educate our uh, our associates. So that's those are some of the ways in which DCS uh, sort of helps uh, kind of improve the uh, and fill the gaps that are in the current educational system. Perfect. Sounds really good. Uh, I'll request Nishrita now to please take over. Uh, uh, Dr. Vig, you've uh, you've kind of already answered what my next question was going to be when you said that you know TCS does sponsor PhD projects and they're validated by your research team and you spoke about the TCS sponsored Coursera courses. So I was going to ask you about you know specific R and D collaborations or capacity building activities with academia, but I think you've you've answered that already. So. Uh, do you have any, um, uh, in your view, some examples of big research problems that, that could benefit from, from academia industry collaborations in this space? Uh, certainly. So, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a host of problems uh, that are very India specific, for example. So one, one problem uh, with AI at the moment, at least AI research at the moment, is that not, not a problem necessarily. It's just that it's extremely dominated. The, most of the developments, most of the great work that is coming out of industrial giants like Google, like Facebook, uh, and most of them are focused on US uh, and Western problems, right? Which, whereas India has a very specific set of problems that are uh, not easily tackled. So for instance, India is a country that has yeah, as we know, has over 30, you know, very, very widely spoken languages. And a lot of the, um, you know, translation techniques uh, don't, don't do very well for Indian languages, for these regional languages in particular. So, uh, you know, th that's just one. Then, you know, a lot of emphasis has been made on autonomous driving, right? But it's been confined to uh, autonomous driving in the US. 
we know from our own experience that the autonomous driving in India is a completely different challenge, right? Uh, similar sort of, uh, you know, differences exist in medicine, in, in the way uh, we, in, in, in the way we uh, are culturally, uh, that need to, that needs to be kind of taken into account when we build an AI application, uh, a large scale AI application within India, and we roll it out uh, to our people. There are, so the, in America, the issue of, there's, there are issues of bias and uh, fairness that come into AI applications, but they're normally centered around the issue of race. Uh, in India, the issues are, you know, maybe around caste or around something else or religion or something else. So uh, all of the, to ensure that your AI applications are completely free of any bias of any kind. Uh, I mean, the, what I'm saying is that the concerns are a bit different in India as opposed to uh, uh, the concerns in the US. And so a, a kind of joint research framework, which uh, where you know, the, these concerns can be uh, perhaps ad addressed in the, with, with the technologies uh, and the great research that comes, uh, often comes from America, but is now coming from India as well. And we, and we combine that knowledge with, uh, you know, and, and we adapt it to our own sort of uh, spe specific needs is, is something that would be uh, very useful. So joint research projects, uh, uh, with industry, with academia. Um, I have noticed over the past few years that increasingly a large number of our students from these universities are going abroad, uh, especially to the US for exchange programs, for internships. And that's a very encouraging thing. And perhaps that can be uh, you know, implemented at a, or encouraged at a governmental or a federal level. Um, and uh, one, one particular successful uh, uh, sort of venture ha has been these joint PhD programs. They have been enormously successful and have produced really high quality PhD. Uh, one in particular has been this uh, Monash uh, IIT Bombay joint PhD program. Um, and I think this is, because it's been so successful, it should perhaps be replicated. Uh, the same model can perhaps be replicated uh, across a number of universities uh, so that our students can get exposure to, uh, you know, the uh, uh, to the American way of doing research, um, and uh, can get, get enriched from that. Uh, and we can produce top quality talent uh, from our institution. Um, other, uh, I mean, other uh, avenues are, uh, of course, uh, like I said, the, the big thing is to identify the big problems in agriculture, in healthcare, uh, and where AI can play a leading role in really improving the lives of a lot of people um, and doing joint sort of research projects with the US and with India. Uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Vick, speaking about partnerships and collaborations, like you were, you know, you were talking about, um, talking about the role of government. So. Uh, what do you think federal agencies, uh, you know, can do in terms of new initiatives or investments in infrastructure to prepare, uh, you know, the AI workforce of the future? And can you comment a little bit about the role of the, this tripartite partnership between government, academia, and industry in kind of accelerating that um, AI R and D, uh, you know, and developing the AI workforce? Right. So one one great example of that um, of infrastructure being uh, kind of scaled up. For, uh, for a lot of people has been Google Colab, right? So Google has made uh, its collaboratory uh, you know, platform free of charge available to anyone with a Google account. Uh, and so anybody in India who wants to kind of start up uh, and but doesn't have compute resources um, or the you know, GPU resources to run deep models and run their AI models on, all they need is access to an internet. Uh, connection uh, and a basic sort of laptop, and they can start doing, uh, you know, running AI models and running AI code uh, on their machines. 
so this is a this is this is a great example of how the of of an industrial giant you know providing uh, you know ai uh, sort of uh, infrastructure to uh, you know the general public uh, and why the reason it's doing that is of course uh, there is a kind of csr uh, sort of uh, uh, motivation behind it uh, but it's also because they realize that the more people uh, become comfortable with AI and use AI, uh, eventually that talent pool is going to benefit the overall development of artificial intelligence, which they feel is going to improve the lives of um, everybody and, and it eventually improve even Google's business. So it's, it's uh, similar initiatives uh, sort of uh, within TCS, uh, you know, we, uh, like I mentioned, we have that research scholar program where we sponsor PhDs. We're doing that, of course, we're doing that to improve the standards of PhD students coming out, but we're also doing that with a slightly selfish uh, motivation of being able to hire higher quality PhDs eventually and find those, find that talent coming back to us. So, uh, so what I'm say, trying to suggest is that industry has a vital role to play. The government has a vital role to play to ensure that you know um, it's as accessible. Uh, AI is as accessible as possible to as many people. Um, make make sure that the uh, you know uh, people have access to an internet connection. They have access to these online educational tools. Um, and, uh, and, and, and define long-term problems that have been plaguing this country for a long time, like access to healthcare, right? So the uh, telemedicine, for example, can be really, you know, revolutionize healthcare in this country. It's, it, it would take a joint collaboration of industry, of academia and, uh, you know, the government to make it happen, but it can be done. Uh, right, so, uh, and, and it can really kind of uh, improve. Agriculture is another area which is seeing, or which is already seeing a lot of benefits from technological advances in AI. You know, farmers are able to just send a picture of their crop and uh, get it diagnosed whether the crop is, uh, you know, needs to be uh, treated with pesticides or there's some problem or uh, something like that. Similarly, soil samples can be assessed now remotely. So <laughs> all of this is very positive. It's a very uh, sort of new day for, uh, for the world. If we get our act together and kind of collaborate in a, uh, with, with the government and academia. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Vig. Um, you did, you know, already from text from IUSCA's point of view, what's important for us are, you know, what are the opportunities for US India collaborations? And you did speak about uh, the internship opportunities and the joint PhD programs. You gave the example of the Monash IIT Bombay uh, partnership. But, you know, uh, do you see any other opportunities for US India collaborations in, in, in this space and any other models that you, you think could, you know, foster these partnerships? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are others uh, outside of this uh, might require a little more brainstorming, but, uh, you know, holding workshops, holding conferences, ensuring a, a exchange of ideas between the scientists uh, here and, you know, trying to break down the IP barriers, which is often a, the biggest barrier actually to uh, proper collaboration is the fact that, you know, both parties want to have access to the IP. So maybe if some joint IP agreement could be signed uh, for a joint research center or something which breaks down these IP sort of barriers, uh, it would allow for a more free flow of ideas between, uh, between the two uh, sort of nations and the, the two uh, countries. So that's, uh, I mean, those are some suggestions. Uh, of course, the government has a big role to play in ensuring that, you know, the curriculum, uh, I, you know, industry can't change the curriculum, only the government has the power to kind of uh, influence uh, school curriculum and ensure that AI is at the college curriculum and so on. An institute which 
recognizes where AI is, where the problems, uh, where problems that are specific to a nation like US or India, which, uh, which are not being addressed currently, uh, and uh, you know, dreams up big projects like you know, universal healthcare for uh, at least remote healthcare for all Indians or something like that, some ambitious project and goes after it um, using uh, all the available resources, all the scientists that we have at our, at our disposal uh, and uh, engaging with the top scientists in the US. Uh, that's the that's really the only way research will move. And, and of course, if there's uh, we we already have extensive cross country partnerships. I mean, TCS is heavily partnered with Microsoft and Google and um, you know all Indo US uh, sort of commerce uh, uh, commerce partnerships are already there. Uh, I mean, I, 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 that's all I can think of off the top of my head at the moment. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Vic. I think I am done with my set of the questions. So, um, Chitali, any, any, any concluding? Thank thoughts? you very much. They were real useful insights from the industry perspective. Thank you. Um, any last minute thoughts, Dr. Vic, that you think that we did not ask you and you want to share and you are, you want, you feel that we should know any, anything? No, no, I think you you did a fairly thorough job uh, <laughs> of asking me uh, good questions. I, uh, I probably should have been better prepared for this, <laughs> uh, but I, I apologize if, if I was rambling in, in the middle. Uh, Once at all, thank you very much. And in case you feel that you, after the interview also, you feel that something you would like to share with us, you're most welcome. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.